Welcome to Brainwaves Bistro. Grab yourselves a cuppa, kick back, and join us for mental health talk with a positive vibe. Here's Julianne. Yes, an uplifting topic today. You can't wait for this, can you? We're going to talk about volunteer surf lifesaving. It is actually part of the Aussie culture, the Australian culture. We, and even in the U.S., may have heard of Bondi Beach and may have seen a series about life-saving in the series Bondi Rescue, which is in the States and was a great hit in Australia and still is. Maybe even Manly Beach, where the first life-saving movement started. But Bondi claims this is the first, so there's always a competition. But maybe lesser known is that Avalon Beach, which is further north in Sydney, was sought after for the series Baywatch. This created a huge controversy, division with our locals, and as we say in Australia, a bit of a stink. I must tell you a funny story about the guest you're about to hear. I pursued him in Avalon. I found him in the Avalon coffee shop. I wasn't exactly after him. I want to know who the trainer was. And I was told, I am. I'm the co-op. I went, yay, bingo, got it. Right. But welcome to my host, co-host, Barb Smith and Steve Broderick. Steve represents Avalon SLSC, which means Surf Life Saving. Um, what's the SC for? SLSA, Australia. Got the C there on. And is Skills Maintenance Coordinator and a Trainer. Hi, hi there, guys. Welcome. Hi. Hi, Steve. Hi, Julianne. Hello, lovely Barb. Always lovely to have you here. Now, Ju- uh, Steve, you are the skills maintenance trainer for Avalon Club. Tell us why Avalon Surf Club and Avalon are so special. Well, Avalon is special because I live there. Ah, I live there too, sort of. <laughs> Bob did once. Um, we, we go back a long way. Avalon is one of the best surf breaks in Australia. In fact, uh, going right back to 1915 when Duke Kahanamoto came to Australia from Hawaii to demonstrate surfing, he demonstrated it at Freshwater Beach. But before that, he'd gone up all the Sydney beaches and he rated Avalon as the best. Wow, I didn't know that. Wow. But unfortunately for Avalon, we were too far away from Sydney in 1915 and uh, and the press wouldn't go up that far north, so they had to do the demonstration at Freshwater. But 10 years after the Duke, uh, Avalon Surf sort of Life Saving Club was founded and we've been going strong ever since. So we're up to our 100th year next year, uh, which will be a big celebration. That I'll be there. I'll be there. Mm-hmm. Now... Um, Narrabeen may have been famous, made famous by the Beach Boys in their song Surfing USA, but Avalon is really where all the great surfers go in Australia to surf. Uh, and although I'm not a surfer myself, I believe it's because it's got both a great left-hand break and a great right-hand break. So those surfers out there uh, listening will want to know about that. Oh, yeah. Um, so we've, we've spawned that Avalon... Uh, world-class surfers like Mark Richards, Simon Anderson, Midget Farrell, Barton Lynch, Lane Beachley, and a lot, lot more. We're very special in amongst uh, Australia because we have a high school that is situated right at the beach, and people who want to become great surfers go to that high school as kids. So we have, a at Avalon, a really special relationship with surfing. Uh, we, we do all the surf... Uh, safety training for the kids at school and in exchange for that when I stand at the beach I can look out there and see dozens of surfers that I know have got bronze medallions or surf rescue certificates who can help me if I need to do a rescue or something else to make the beach safe. So that is a special relationship that I think most surfers will be quite astounded at because in almost every other beach in the world, the surfers and the swimmers and the surf lifesavers all argue and um, I don't know, very territorial. But in Avalon, we seem to get along quite well together. Oh, that's tremendous, yeah. 
Well, I've served there many times myself and I'm very proud of the people you mentioned that have gone and they give back too, Steve. I know they do, uh, particularly Lay and um, Tommy, Tommy Carroll. Do we mention him? He's, we he's didn't mention Tommy Carroll, no. No, well, I got you there, didn't I? I'm listening. <laughs> a long list. There's <laughs> a very long list. Now, what I want to know too, um, it looks like a very safe beach, but sometimes it can be uh, a little treacherous. Would you like to explain? Yes, Avalon is, relatively Avalon is a treacherous beach. It's more treacherous than most of the Sydney beaches. And that is because we've got a rip at both ends and we've got a rip that moves about in the middle of the beach depending on the surf, the tide, wind direction and things like that. So that makes it a little bit dangerous because that rip can move um, hour to hour up and down the beach. So we need to really be switched on as surf lifesavers at Avalon to make sure that people aren't getting into that particular rip. Yeah, well, um, I, I know... As a lifesaver for eight years with you guys, a little bit before, a little bit before your time, um, I experienced that. I was on the beach, and it was Australia Day. Now Australia Day means barbecues and beach, and we get so many people that have never ever had surf instruction or really understand the surf. And I can remember one day it was, oh, it was a bit of a nightmare. Um, we had. Lovely, lovely black ladies, i.e. in their burkas and their hijabs, caught in the shore break. Black floating and froth. Well, it was mayhem, but we got them all out safely. But I do remember Australia Day. And uh, to be honest, it's not my favourite day to patrol, Steve. I funny you should say that. That's the day that we all dread every year. Because I get it all the time. I used to. All these people come to the beach to have a barbecue and celebrate at the beach, and we get so many people, particularly people who are new to Australia, who come to the beach and they can't swim and they get into trouble. So our our philosophy at Avalon is not to save people but to keep them safe before they need saving. And so we try and make sure that these people aren't swimming in dangerous places and that they do know where they swim, where they can safely swim. Yeah. So we, we set aside places for the people who turn up uh, in burgers or the people who come along and can't swim. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as a, a family-oriented club and beach and we're welcoming of everyone. So just because you've got burger on doesn't mean that you can't swim in the ocean and enjoy the surf. Um, you just have to be careful of what sort of uh, material that burger is made out of and that it doesn't hold on to too much water and drag you under. But, yeah. um, there are a lot of uh, uh, new designs coming out and we're finding that that's something that we see on our beaches quite regularly now. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, go on. Uh, there's one thing I want to ask and it took me a little while to learn. The rip... Now, as you said, we have three major rips that don't operate all the time, folks. <laughs> don't panic. Um, can you tell us what's the best way to survive or not get caught in a rip? And if you are, what to do? Well, the easy way to get to not get caught in a rip is to uh, either swim between the flags or if you're at a beach that isn't patrolled, my favourite advice to give to people is look at where the surfers are going now because the surfers go out in the rip because that's the easiest way for them to get out to the back of the waves. Is there one so, called the elevator or is that a different beach? Is that uh, ours? Yes, we have, the, we have the North Ave elevator. Yep, I'm right. I see. I haven't forgotten. <laughs> and, and all the surfers come down and jump in the elevator and go out to the back of the surf. Mm. So if, you, if you're a swimmer and you're not, confident in swimming at the beach, that is not the place to be. Yeah. The place to be is where waves are coming into the beach because the way a rip forms is if the waves come into the beach and all that water has to go out somewhere. So it flows along the beach and goes out where the rips are. Yeah, so, so you don't want to be in the rip. If you are in a rip, what I tell people is just float. Yeah. Don't try and swim because you'll wear yourself out and sink. If you float, 
the water will actually bring you around to the safe part of the beach where the water's coming back into the beach because what goes out must come back in. So it's relatively easy, but it's I understand it is very confronting for people to say, oh, okay, I'm going to float further out to sea to come back in. But that is the safest way to do it. Uh, float, put your arm in the air, people will come and save you. Yeah, that's great advice, Steve. And also I always look for kind of frothy water or like visually you can see a rip. Could you tell us what to look for in terms of a rip? In When you look out to the ocean, you can see um, not distressed water, but um, wa- water that's slightly... Well, I'm not doing very well at this, Steve. Long time since I was a lifesaver. It's quite... In- In a relatively calm day, the rips are dark green water because it's deep water where the water is flying back out to sea. Yes, thank you. On a a rough day where there's a lot of white water caused by the waves churning it up, you'll see a column of froth going out well past where the waves are breaking. Yes, gotcha. So they're the the two ways of telling it. I know they're they're polar opposites. One day it might be dark green, the next day it's white. But it's the fact that it's flowing out past where the waves are breaking is the important thing to look at. My advice to anybody is sit there and look at what's happening on the beach for 10 minutes before you go in the water, if, mm. unless there's a, a surf lifesaver to talk to. Yeah. And always talk to the surf lifesavers. We love to chat. Yeah, we do, don't we? Here we go. I'm doing... Podcasts, I love to chat. Now, Steve, tell us about the skills and the training that you give to your budding volunteers. Well, we we start with the the basic uh, training that we give kids is called a surf rescue certificate. They, that's given to kids when they're about. Uh, 13 years old and that's training on how to rescue somebody from the water and how to help with first aid and uh, resuscitation if necessary. Yeah. Then we have the basic um, base level foundation um, skill which is the bronze medallion and we give we teach people things in the bronze medallion that we dearly hope they will never have to use in their life. So we teach them how to resuscitate an unconscious drowned person. We hope that we never have to use that. We teach them how to deal with major traumas, uh, with tourniquets and things like that. We hope they never have to use that. And we teach them how to deal with spinal injuries when people are dumped in the surf. Again, those are very traumatic things to deal with and we hope they never have to use that. But inevitably, we do end up using those skills on the beach. But my role in the club is to make sure that all of our 900 members have those skills and that they're updated every year so that every year they learn the latest on how those techniques are deployed and used, how how successful they've been in the last 12 months, and I make sure that they're able to do that again now. So they never get stale in their skills. They get updated every year. I so think, that's my role. I think that's one of the Someone asked me yesterday, they said, you know, we used to do A, B, C, D, um, and you could explain that, and now there's an S in there, and they asked me what the S was for, and I said signal, but I don't know if that's right because it's been updated since I I was trained. So we, we have a much longer acronym now. We have DRS. A, B, C, D, or doctors A, B, C, D. Mm-hmm. And, and the D start, is the first step in it is get everybody out of danger. So oh, make danger. sure you've got people yeah. away from danger. The R is to look for a reaction or from the person um, and to make sure that they really are unconscious before you start to do anything with them. <laughs> so, uh, can you find a response from that patient? S is actually sent for help. Mm. If you've got an unconscious patient on the beach, you want help. And so S for help means send for an ambulance, a defibrillator, a, a, uh, and any anything else that you might think might be needed at the time, oxygen, first aid kit, things like that. Then we go into the ABC, which everybody learnt as a kid, which is airway, breathing, 
and CPR. So check that their airway is clear. You don't want to start putting air into them if they've got a mouthful of water because that'll just blow water down into their lungs. You want to make sure that they're not breathing before you start trying to breathe for them. And then you do the chest compressions. The chest compressions are quite violent and you really have to go deep in the chest. So it's quite confronting and mm. traumatic for people to, to do that. Yeah. And then the last letter is D, and that's the defibrillator. So the latest piece of technology that we brought to the beach of a number of years ago was an automatic external defibrillator, which uh, kickstarts the heart again in basic terms. It's a lot more complicated than that. Um, and a number of people will be shaking their head and saying, no, that's not what a defibrillator does. But effectively, it monitors the heart, puts a charge across the heart. Effectively, it stops the heart so the heart can start itself properly again. Can I just add there, if I can operate that one efficiently, then anybody should learn and can do it. Yeah, defibrillators are a great piece of equipment. You press the on button on it. It's so easy. And it, and it tells you what to do. Yep, it speaks to you. And it so, does. Yeah. It tells you exactly what to do, and it asks you if you've called an ambulance. <laughs> it reminds you what to do. Now, just yeah. so, just something off that I'm thinking of. Has it been changed now that you just do uh, cardiac and not breathing in an emergency, not resuscitation in terms of breathing? There was a little time. Tell me I'm wrong. It came through at one stage that you just concentrate on um, the compressions. Am I wrong, Steve? I'm afraid you are. Oh, um, well, I'm glad I hung up my um, cap then. It would save a lot of people. The advice is still to give 30 compressions and two rescue breaths. They did look at, they did a longitudinal study in the US a few years ago that looked at uh, the results from doing compressions only versus doing compressions and breaths. Uh -huh. And the finding of that was that the compressions are certainly the most important thing you're doing. But the, the short break while you do two breaths yeah, not only right. gets more air into the patient, but also allows you to reset and start and get your compressions right again. Yeah, because it's very tiring. Yeah. Compressions are very tiring. Mm. I would challenge anybody to do it for more than about four minutes. It's very difficult to do. Yeah. And, and because it's so confronting to do it on a, a real person, it's very tiring. It's it's not a good thing at all. So we try and do that. There are machines. Ambulances now have a machine called a Laodal machine, which uh, does the compressions for you. Yeah. Uh, but we don't have them on the beaches just yet. Okay, they're coming. That's wonderful. Now, you've given us a great brief on skills and training. I was going to just go back to my time decades ago, I think it was about 15 years ago. In our patrols, we were allocated roles. This happened decades ago. So I was actually allocated the role of whistleblower and crowd control, which was a bit upsetting. I wanted to do more than that and do the mandatory coffee run, which you're probably very familiar with. But I just happened to be on a pro patrol with champion swimmers and board paddlers. And so that's it. That's the way it goes. I was a bit deluded. I thought I'd be the swimmer, but uh, no, ended up with the whistle, Steve, sadly. Well, now, the whistle is still very important. I know, I wasn't denigrating. Make sure that people are swimming to, between the flags or at least that they know that they should be swimming between the flags. And it won't surprise you that there is still a mandatory coffee run for every <laughs> How do you have yours next time I'm down? I'll get it at Swell where we met. That's an Avalon hang for great coffee. Um, and I'll tell Barry that too, that he's on air. Now, this is very important. Our nippers movement where children age six and up learn skills for surf and swim safety. Yes, I was an Avalon mum too. And um, overseas, you may not have heard of this time, nippers, but I, I must uh, lord my son, Sam, learnt great skills, nippers, in uh, Avalon and ended up a state champion. So thank you, Avalon, and thank you to this proud, by this proud mum. Many thanks for what you did. And you're going to tell us a little about nippers. A little bit. Well, 
Yes, well, nippers do start when they're six. Um, some start a little bit earlier um, if they're brave enough to um, to come along with the six-year-olds. Mm. Um, but six is the general age that we think uh, kids should start to learn about the ocean. And it starts with very funny little games on the beach for the kids where they are required to run out into the water to they're about knee-deep and then run back in again. So it gradually gets them used to the water. Then... As they get older, we get them deeper and deeper into the water and st- until they're getting to a point where they're off their feet and they have to swim around their parents uh, while they're in the water. And then we get them at the age of nine or ten onto boards, uh, rescue boards as opposed to surfboards, and get them out in the ocean doing races and things like that. And end up by the time they're 11 or 12, very competent and very confident in the water. And some of those kids at the age of 11 and 12 have already rescued some of their mates from rips and things oh, like that. And fantastic. It's a great program and it's at every beach in Australia. And we've got about 300 kids in our program at the moment at Avalon. And that's just wonderful. And I want to mention here too, um, US Bureau Chief now in Sydney from New York for the New York Times said that bringing his family out here, the best thing was joining the surf club. I think it was Bondi and how resilient his kids became, how they got an incredible sense of community and uh, just a wonderful experience. So that's a lovely thing to hear from someone who is a foreign correspondent and war journalist now based in Sydney. So we should be proud. Um, And... We're now going to talk to Barb. She's got a little spin on nippers called Little Dippers, folks. She's got a bit to say. Barb, come on in. Oh, thank you, Julianne and Steve. So, yes, Little Dippers is a play on words of nippers, and it's part of the Autism Swim program where each participant uh, are supported by fully qualified surf volunteer swimmers. Usually uh, about four people per swimmer is needed. It's run by Autism Swim every summer. It's a modified nippers and surf education program. Dippers inclusively welcomes individuals of all ages. I mean, it can be kiddies, but it can go up to all ages and abilities and operates in partnership with the local Surf Life Saving Club. And I probably mentioned to Julianne before, um, my husband Laura and I, we haven't... um, uh, we're not volunteers as such, but we raise money for our local program. And it's so wonderful to see those children, uh, particularly when we've had little ones who've had autism and have been very, very scared of being in being in the surf. So they've graduated one fellow I told uh, Julianne about, little Bobby, who um, was just stayed on the grass. And then he eventually got to the sand and then in the water and then got on a little bodyboard and was pushed along and helped. But that took three years. Mm. So it's just an amazing program. So Autism Swim run that and Little Dippers are a beautiful um, a side spin of what you and other people have done with doing the nippers. Okay, that's a wonderful thing that you do. And Laurie, your husband, who has is an OAM, that's a type of order of Australia for what he's done for the country. And there are, I wanted to ask you too, as an Olympic volunteer ambassador, good on you, you must have met some very high-profile surfers who were trained at Australian Beaches Bar. Yes, that's true, Julianne. And one who comes to mind instantly, who's been mentioned in the program just before, uh, was uh, is, is Lane Beachley, AO. So she's got a, a medal from our government to recognise her work. And she was a liaison officer with the Australian Olympic Committee in London 2012 Olympics, where my husband Laurie and I were also Olympic volunteers. So we were embedded in the village and Lane is a surfing legend claiming a remarkable seven world titles, the only surfer in the world to win, um, I think, with six consecutively. And what a great person to have in the Olympic Village embedded with the Australian team. But the athletes were able to talk to her about the stress to perform, how to deal with the media, and so many other topics that only somebody of that 
um, you know, in that criteria would actually understand the pressures. So she was able to hand on her knowledge, which was just fantastic, and to hear her talk and um, take those people aside and help them was great. And I think that's one of the great things we as an Olympic committee have um, tucked up our sleeve, all these beautiful people who will go over there and help. Even I think last two or a couple of times ago we mentioned um, – Peter Brock. Peter Brock, and he Gorgeous was one of the Peter liaison Brock. officers, rest in peace. And, and he also was able in his own way to help calmly deal with the stress that Olympic athletes go through. Well, I would like to be privileged to say that I would like to say I'm a friend of um, Lane's. I did train with her a couple of times. She doesn't remember me. But now I'm a member of her academy. Um, and she she gives talks, inspires, and she's just an amazing woman. And one of the the things I remember, the definition of success is thriving in the tensions of life. And... Uh, I think that applies to a lot of people and it applies to the ocean too, thriving in the tensions of the ocean. Now, I want to know, Steve, um, you and other Aussie Lifesavers from SLA uh, help train groups from other countries. Tell us. Uh, well, uh, once a year, a group of Avalon trainers uh, heads over to Singapore. Uh, there is a expat community there of Australians who want their kids when they arrive back in Australia to be able to participate um, at the beach. And so we go over there to Singapore and we put the parents through a bronze medallion and we help plan their uh, NIVAS program over there uh, so that they can uh, be ready to go when they get back to Australia. It's a, an interesting uh, volunteer movement. We don't get paid for that. We, you know, they obviously pay our airfare over there, but we do this as a volunteer thing with Singapore. Uh, and we find that the Singapore lifeguards uh, at the beach come along and watch what we're doing and participate in what we're doing as well uh, because they, they tell us that their, um, their training isn't as in-depth as ours is, so they want, to, they want to participate in ours. Similarly, uh, we have... Uh, we have a lot of uh, backpackers in Avalon that come from yes, South America at the moment. Yeah, so Brazil. We, we've got Argentinians and uh, Chileans who are mm. participating in our Ponce Medallion training at Avalon. And again, they're telling us that what they get in their own country is nothing like the depth of knowledge that they get from doing our training. So we're pretty proud of uh, the level that we've got to in Australia in training surf lifesavers. Oh, I might add that while I was over in the US recently, I was um, over there for work and I, being a beach sort of guy, rather than staying in LA, I stayed out of Manhattan Beach. And when I went swimming uh -huh. at Manhattan Beach, the local lifeguards came out on his jet ski to ask me if I was committing suicide swimming. So I not see. <laughs> Only to find out that I was Australian and he was Australian. And he oh. came from Cronulla, a, a city wow. beach. Wow. <laughs> and he said, oh, yeah, all the lifeguards in California uh, are um, Australians because we have a better qualification than the Americans get. <laughs> wow. So so there we're up on Baywatch, that's for sure. Some <laughs> of us may not quite have the cleavage, but we're very efficient. Should I say that? Uh, yeah, I've said it. Now, this is – we have a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. We have Avalon Sir Swims for everybody. They come from everywhere. And um, we have our own club championships sort of fun, which are fun, and our national championships where many of our superstars go. And I must honour an amazing person. And you, I might get her name wrong, but hopefully she'll, she'll listen. And a legend of our club, Avalon, who competed well into her 70s. Is it Virginia Head? Is that the right name? That's correct. Yes, oh, got it. I meant to ask you before. I, 
a lovely Virginia head. Just she, she is so inspiring. And uh, when you're listening, you are a legend, Virginia. I actually won the Women's Masters once for Avalon. Uh, there weren't many in it. And Virginia had been suffering from an operation on her shoulder. I would have been whipped if she was 100%, Steve. But, Steve, tell us about the fantastic surf swims where people of all ages come to compete from far afield and we raise money for the club. Yeah. Um, well, most most of the uh, clubs in New South Wales have their own resident surf swim. But we pride ourselves on having the longest one. So uh, we we have a range of them from little ones that kids can get involved through to a really long one on the day, which is over two and a half kilometres long. And that particular one starts two beaches away. So you have to swim out off a nice safe beach, around the headland, across the next beach, around that headland and into Avalon. So only the best of the best participate in that one. Wow. Can I just interrupt there? I thought I did in my younger days the big swim from Palm Beach. I did it often. Palm Beach to Whale Beach around the headland. So you're saying it's been extended? I'm saying that uh, the Avalon uh, Beach to Beach is longer. It's called the Around the Bends. For anybody I who love it. The local jargon, the Bends is a main road that goes past one of the beaches and we skip around the bends out in the water. But that's now the longest um, swim and it is the last one of the season and it is on in March. Uh, Well, Um, I don't know if you'll see me there this time, Steve, but I have to do a bit of training, I think. Now, um, what I... Oh, you've answered about that question. Um, Now... I want to know, lastly, this is important to me because this show is about mental health with a positive vibe and Surf Life Saving Australia is very involved with mental health. Can you tell us what happens in a trauma situation with our lifesavers? Um, Yes, well, I think I've mentioned a couple of times that it's quite traumatic if you're doing a rescue um, and you're getting somebody back from being having a near-death experience so we have found that we have to have that level of uh traumatic incident support uh ptsd is real it's not imaginary and it can come along at any time after you've been involved in a traumatic incident uh different people react different in different ways uh but what we have found is that everybody has some reaction to a traumatic incident, which is not a positive reaction. So we've started a program called TIPS, which stands for Traumatic Incident Peer Support. And at any time anybody does a rescue on a beach in Sydney, or if anybody puts their hand up and they're a surf lifesaver, TIPS will get in touch with them and TIPS will uh, make sure they're okay, help them through it. Uh, we'll put a, a specific program in place to support that person and make sure that their mental health is looked after on the way through. We we are one of the biggest volunteer organisations in the world, but we certainly need our volunteers and we can't have volunteers that are suffering mental health-related issues that we caused uh, by putting them into situations that were traumatic. So, yes, our TIPS program uh, works very well, we think, and we're going to improve it all the time. And they have uh, contacts with the Black Dog Institute, the um, Lifeline, which it, uh, is a, an online program, and a number of other organisations. Uh, we, we, we also have a junior program um, which is fairly widespread around Australia called 180, which is a youth suicide project prevention program and we uh, host them at our club from time to time and we give them free access to our facilities to support our kids. So um, we're very much aware of mental health being an issue in our society and we're very aware of the fact that traumatic incidences really um, have a negative impact on people's mental health and we need to address that. Oh, bless you all. It's so important. And um, I'm going to hand over to our lovely, lovely Barb Smith, 
to tell us a little bit more about what we need. We need money too for our SLA. I actually did have, do a book one time and donated the um, profits to them because it's just you can see how much goes into it and how much Surf Life Saving gives back. Now, Barb, you're going to talk a little bit more about mental health research briefly, are you not? That's, that's right, Julianne. So, yes, the Life Saving Association does wonderful things concerning mental health, and we here also like to shine the light on mental health research with the Black Dog Institute. So, so happy that you mentioned that one as well, Steve. Um, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, we're very fortunate to have uh, Steve on the Brainwaves Bistro show today. I believe we should all be like Steve and give back to our communities and please support the not-for-profit Black Dog Institute. You can just Google it and please give. Uh, Mental health research needs your funds and no donation, no donation is too small. Uh, thank you very much and have a great day and a great one tomorrow.